I'm gonna, sorry, I would not look at the cam for a second. Um, I'm gonna change the zoom properties a little bit, which might give some of y'all motion sickness just because I moved the camera down a little bit and now it seems to be a little out of focus. Nope, that's worse. Uh, device, properties, focus set to 15. Okay, much better, okay. Um, hey everybody, good morning, happy Friday. Um, today I have for y'all uh, a pretty straightforward one part question sketch the solution region of this system. Uh, and I actually want you to do it by hand before you get into um, doing it in Desmos because these are both functions that you should be able to graph by hand. So I have y is strictly greater than or equal to three halves x, y is greater than negative three halves x, and then y is less than negative x squared plus nine. Uh, use the rules that we learned yesterday in order to graph these. Keep in mind the difference between solid lines and dotted lines, and then you know use test points to shade appropriately. And then after that, I'm going to talk a little bit about a physics snippet. Uh, this is to say, I'm just going to talk a little bit about a case in physics where you will be asked to use these exact mathematics next year, because it always seems a little abstract to try and figure out why it is we are, um, like, why would we care about the intersection between uh, two functions. I want to give you all an example, like a, a hard and fast hands-on example uh, of a case in physics where we would use these equations in order to get a relevant answer, and that case is elastic collisions. In physics, whenever two objects hit and bounce off of one another, um, in order to predict what that system is going to do in the future, the problem that you are solving mathematically is actually the intersection of a line and an ellipse. Uh, and of course, this stuff that I'm going to talk about here in the second half, uh, this is not part of the class. This won't be quizzed on next week when we have our mid-chapter quiz. This is just for your own knowledge so that y'all have a little bit of the correct expectations for what physics is all about. Yeah, take a few minutes on this. I'm going to take attendance and then we'll get rolling. And uh, for the most part today is just going to be uh, time to work on the homework and get your questions answered. Um, so if you have any homework questions, I would love to answer that stuff on stream. Uh, just so y'all know, next week we have one more section to cover. We'll be talking about partial fractions and partial fraction decomposition, which I believe is a topic that you cover in Algebra 2. Uh, and then on the last day before we head off to spring break on Wednesday, we'll be taking our mid-chapter quiz. Any questions out there about that stuff or what we're doing for the class? Uh, Mr. Robinson, how do we take a quiz? You just post it and we do and submit the work? Uh, yep. Yeah, I'm going to post the quiz. Um, yeah, I'm going to post the quiz and you can either print it out or you can just work it all out on separate paper and then uh, upload it before the class time is over. Um, yeah. All right.
Okay. Um, I think number one is pretty quick. Are you all ready to go over that one? Yeah. I'll take that as a yes. Okay. So uh, for this first equation, y is uh, greater than or equal to three halves x. Uh, does that get a solid line or a dotted line? And how do we know? A dotted line because it has the greater than or or sorry it has the the line on the bottom of the of the sign. I think you got it backwards. A uh, solid line. Uh, solid, yeah. If it's capable of being equal to, this is going to get a solid line because that means that all of the points that appear along that line are valid solutions. What's the uh, y-intercept? Zero. Zero, which is why I'm choosing these two today, just to show a problem where we can't use zero, zero as a test case, and instead we'll have to use some other point. Um, oops, sorry, I think it's a little, yeah, hold on. It's a little trapezoidal and it's bugging me. Eh, eh. I moved the camera all over yesterday because we did a physics lab, which involves like moving a bunch of my camera stuff around to point at the equipment. And I never got it quite lined up again afterwards. Sorry about that. Anyway, uh, zero, zero is our intercept for this first equation. And so I'll go up one, two, three, over one, two. Here's another point on this line. And again, I'm going to connect them with a solid line because points along this line are pieces of the solution. So there is my first equation. Also, somebody's mic is open. Uh, please be mindful of that and try to use the press to talk button to talk. Uh, nonetheless, um, okay. So that's that. And uh, what do you want me to use as a test point? How should we figure out which way we're shading? The one one, uh, or one or one zero. Uh, I like yeah one zero or zero one. Both of those are good points. Just because we you know we can't get the convenience of using zero zero, but we can still use one zero. You know. So I'll go ahead and test the point right here. One comma zero. That's a good test point. So I'll take that and I'll plug it in here to my original equation. And this is to say that, well, one is greater than or equal to three halves times, nope. Oh my God. Come on. I know you still have white out. I'm sorry about that. Zero is greater than or equal to three halves times one. Zero is greater than or equal to three halves. Is that true or false? That is false. And so that means that we are not going to start from this line and shade this way. Instead, we're going to start from the line and shade the other way. So for this first line that I drew, we would have to shade upwards. Okay, uh, now we're on to the second equation. So y is greater than or equal to negative 3 halves x. And so for this equation, I'll use green. Notice that this is strictly greater than, and so this is going to get a dotted line. And its intercept is also 0, 0. So from 0, 0, I'm going to count that slope out. So it'll be down 1, 2, 3 over 1, 2. So that point right there is a point on the line. And so I can connect these two with a dotted line. And again, I would find myself testing a point in order to decide whether or not we're shading up or down. So for this one, I can also use the test point one comma zero. And so I'll plug that in here. And so that is to say that y is greater than negative three halves x. Plug in one zero, zero is greater than negative three halves times one. So zero is greater than negative three halves. Is that true or false? Oh, true. true. That is true. Oh, wait. Yeah. And so from here, I would shade from the green line towards that point. So even for this line, I will be shading up. 
And so up here is the overlap of these two regions. And now for my final equation, y is equal to negative x squared plus nine. What shape is that? Parabola. It's a negative parabola shifted upwards nine units. So I'm gonna go up nine units. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Put that here. Bring down my parabola as a dotted line to go through its roots, three and three. And for this parabola, since it doesn't go through the origin like the other two lines, I can use zero, zero as my test point for it. And so for this parabola, zero is going to be less than negative zero squared plus nine. Zero is less than nine. Is that true or false? True. No, true. That is true. And so we are going to shade downwards towards the origin. which is technically everything down below. However, what we want to get away from here is what the solution region is. And that solution region is the region bounded by the parabola on top and these two lines down below. So I'm actually going to color it in particularly dark. Is this solution region bound or unbound? It's bound. Um, bound. This one's bound because none of the sides of it go off to infinity. When Mr. Robinson, unbound is when it goes off to infinity? Yeah, when one part of your solution region goes off to infinity and as such, it's infinitely large. This has a finite area, so if we knew how to do it with the calculus, we could find the area of that segment. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to switch over to Desmos real quick so that we can see a non-hand-drawn version of this. Um, and then I'll do my little physics talk. I'll try and keep it as short and tight as possible. And so here's what the solution region looks like. We have uh, y is uh, greater than or equal to three halves x. So there's that first one shaded up. Uh, next, we have y is strictly greater than negative three halves x. So a dotted line shaded up. And then y is strictly less than negative x squared plus nine. So that piece moved up and then shaded down. And this region where all three of the shadings overlap is our solution region. Uh, is that part okay? Mr. Robinson, can you write it out algebraically without like a picture? What do you mean? Like the solution region, is there a way to write it out? Like you um yeah and here's the part that you're going to find unsatisfying the way to write it out is to list these three equations there's no other representation you can give for it like you couldn't give this space as a set of numbers um and the reason why you, i mean you could give ranges i suppose but it would be really imprecise you know um but yeah there's no way that you could write the answer as a set of digits there's the problem with that approach is there's an infinite number of numbers between zero and one uh, the only way to describe it is the functions that bound it. All right. That's a good question, yeah. Um, okay, so let me talk a little bit about my physics snippet here uh, and why it is that we would be interested in solving equations like this, like a real-life application, something from my own experience, something in AP physics for those of y'all continuing on to senior year at high school, and for all of y'all continuing on to community college or four-year university. Uh, what I'm about to talk about will be part of your physics education. This is why we are giving you these skills now, because we expect you all to be able to use them confidently next year. Um, so physics is about predicting the motion of various objects and what equations allow us to do that, right? So one common um, type of problem is a collision where two objects crash into each other. And typically in a collision type problem, what you are given is uh, masses and velocities of two objects, and then you need to guess how they are going to hit and bounce off of each other, like two pool balls or two bocce balls or uh, whatever, right? So here's a simulation of uh, a collision. You all can see that on the screen, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So here I have two balls and they hit and they bounce off of each other. So they come in with some initial velocity, and then after they hit off of each other, they bounce back with some final velocity. 
So the question is, how is it that we can take these initial velocities, so this velocity and this velocity, combined with this mass and this mass, and notice after I hit play, they bounce and I stop them, and now the velocities are different, right? So if the magnitudes of these vectors have changed, that is to say that the speed comes out being different than it was before. So after this collision, the red ball is faster than it was before, and the green ball is slower than it was before. And on top of that, their directions have been reversed. One more time. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. So here is what is going on mathematically. And of course, there's a lot of buildup to get to the point of theory that I'm about to present to y'all. I'm just going to give you the reality of the math so that, so that you can see why we care about this stuff. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and talk a little bit about solving these types of equations and how that stuff pertains to elastic collisions. So here is the formality. I have a mass 1. I have a mass 2. This guy is coming in with some initial velocity one. This guy is coming in with some initial velocity two. And after these guys hit and stick, we are gonna get this one launched back with a final velocity. And we are gonna get this one launched back with a final velocity. Is that okay? Right. Now, yeah. the, mm -hmm. the things that we're interested in when it comes to this type of system are what conservation equations allow us to predict the final states of motion. Conservation equations are equations that describe a total which doesn't change. And the nice thing about conservation equations is they allow us to make specific predictions. Now, here's the most basic of all conservation equations, conservation of mass in chemistry. The conservation of mass in chemistry tells us that the total amount of material before a reaction must be equal to the total amount of material after a reaction. And that very straightforward, almost self-evident principle is what allows us to balance chemical equations and do stoichiometry at all, right? Like you, you light something on fire and write out the chemical equation for that, you know that it produces carbon dioxide. So based on the initial amount of material being burned, you can very precisely predict the amount of carbon dioxide that will be produced. And you can verify that experimentally if you set up your experiment in such a way that traps the gas being produced. There are two types of conservation equations that are used in collisions, and that would be conservation of momentum and conservation of energy. And I'm just going to write both of these out because like I said, you know, in lecture you'll learn what exactly gives us back these terms. But for us right now, we're just going to accept what I'm about to write is true. Conservation of momentum tells us that m1 v1 plus m2 v2 right, the masses times the velocities coming in must be equal to m1, m2, v1 final plus m2, v2 final. So there exists some term in physics called momentum. It's mass multiplied by velocity. And we know from physical equations that the total amount of momentum before and the total amount of momentum after that doesn't change. Uh, and here's what the conservation of energy looks like. There exists some physical quantity called energy, which if an object is moving is equal to one half mv squared, right? And that thing also doesn't change before or after this collision. So this is one half m1 v1 squared plus one half m2 v2 squared. And this must be equal to one half m1 v final squared plus one half m2 v2 final squared. And I'm only delaying writing them so that I can color code them. So up to here, is this okay? Are there any questions on what I've written out so far? No? Okay. Looks good.
So here's the deal, and this is surprisingly straightforward if you follow along. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to draw an x, y coordinate axis, but when we do math for various applications, you don't have to use x and y. You use whatever variables are useful to you at the time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a graph of these two functions. except I'm not interested in X and Y's, I'm interested in velocities. So my X axis is going to be the velocity of object one, and my Y axis is gonna be the velocity of object two. So instead of working with X's and Y's and just having X and Y represent, I don't know, positions, like on a piece of graph paper, I'm gonna have these axes represent velocities, and when I work in a space like this that doesn't represent real physical space, we call this type of work in physics working within a phase space. We can say that this is the velocity velocity phase space. And now here is, what's up, man? What is the shape of this equation if I were to graph this? And please keep in mind that VF1 and VF2 are my variables. The left-hand side is just a constant. And this is saying that I have a number times my variable plus a number times my variable. What equation has that form? What shape is that? Line, is it linear? Straight up, yeah. This, linear, this right? right here, yeah. this conservation of momentum equation, it's just a linear equation. So we know what the masses and the velocities and the masses and the velocities are at the start. So that's some kind of constant. And that constant is just gonna be equal to m1 times x, if you will, plus m2 times y. So our momentum equation in this kind of space is actually just a linear equation. I'll start by tossing that on here. So we have some kind of uh, linear equation. And this linear equation in this space represents the conservation of momentum. And what about this equation? Again, let's apply that same thinking. This stuff here on the left, I know what that is. That's just gonna be a number. I would just plug in the left-hand side and get a constant. And then on the right-hand side, I have a constant times x squared plus a constant times y squared. What shape does that give me back? Circle. That is a circle if the masses are equal, but if the masses are not equal, what equation would it give me back? Uh-huh, that gives back an ellipse. So the right. energy equation would just become some constant on the left. I'm just gonna give it a different letter to show that these two are different. But yeah, this is just m1 x squared over two plus m2 y squared over two. And this right here is our conservation of energy equation. And yeah, it's x squared and y squared. And if they have different constants, this makes an ellipse. So this mm -hmm. is to say that in this abstracted phase space, the conservation of energy makes some kind of ellipse. And so here's what the physics of the universe is doing every single time two objects collide. Before these objects crashed into each other, they had this set of values. So this is velocity one and velocity two before the collision, but what do we know about the intersections of ellipses and circles? How many intersections do they have? Either none, one, two, or two. Yeah, or two. Either none, one, or two. Those are all possible, but in this specific case, how many intersections? Two. 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 two yeah. That means that this combination of velocities, this V1 and this V2, this is the combination of velocities after the collision. How about that? So what physics is doing, and I'm not just saying like what the physics that humans invented is doing. No, 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 literally what the universe is doing. Every time this happens out in reality, literally every time two objects crash, the universe is like, well, okay, the momentum and the ellipse, or sorry, the momentum and the energy, those things can't change because the momentum is represented by a linear equation and the energy is re represented by an elliptical equation. At the moment they collide with one another, 
those values switch from one intersection of that ellipsin line to the other intersection of that ellipsin line. Boop. Yeah, sorry, there's a question out there. Yeah, um, whenever you're about to see if there's a solution or not, and you can't factor, does that mean no solutions exist? If it's not factorable with grouping? No, no it means answer? that you need to do more math to get the answer. So the quadratic equation? Quadratic equation or preferably com completing the square. Okay. If you're unsure whether or not it's supposed to work out cleanly or if it's going to work out to wacky decimals, I would recommend graphing it in Desmos. Or if you have a specific question, just holler it at me and I'll do it on the stream because I have the homework open. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's my quick little spiel about a physics, about why it is we yeah. find ourselves caring about this stuff. Mr. Um, yeah. yes? uh, I have a question. Um, what happens during an uh, inelastic equation? Um, Inelastic equations are actually even more boring. You don't need the energy equation because in an inelastic collision, energy is not conserved. So you only yeah. need this first equation to solve for what happens in an inelastic collision. You don't need the second equation at all. Mm. So yeah. just when they when they collide, it just they just collide and just uh, nothing else happens. Like they don't move apart when it's inelastic. When it's inelastic, two objects hit and stick, and you yeah. can still okay. do these calculations to predict what happens in that case, but the right. formulations end up being different. Mm -hmm. um, right. But yeah, just a tiny bit of physics to explain to y'all why we care about this stuff. Uh, other fun fact is the fact that, uh, do y'all know roughly the story of um, uh, when it was in his lifetime that Isaac Newton invented physics and most of calculus? Yeah, wasn't it like, uh, during the Black Plague, um, yeah. it's like uh, or, or, it actually was, the Black Plague, the Black, the Black Death, was a long time yeah. before Newton did physics. Physics was being done at the late 1700s, but yeah, he was oh, sent home from school because of the great the Great Plague of London. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The and big. with his time being stuck at home, avoiding the plague, is when he did his like m most important work. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, anyways, this time is yours. If y'all have any questions about the current homework assignment, just holler at me. Um, yeah, that's all we're doing. Uh, Mr. Robinson? Yep. Uh, did you get my homework? I turned it in like yesterday, but I don't know if it got turned in because Google Classroom was really laggy yesterday. Yeah, it was. Give me one second. Mm. Yes. Yeah, okay, I got thank it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, once you've turned in your homework, feel free to roll out or if you want to like hang out and work. Also, feel free to ask questions, or if y'all just want to chat, I'm also here for that. Okay, thank you, Ms. Robinson. Have a nice weekend. Yup, you too. And next week's going to be cool. It's super short. We're done on Wednesday. Is this spring break next week? Yeah. Does that mean there's no Zoom and stuff? Wait, what? Next week, there's no Zoom and stuff after Wednesday? Uh, yeah, Wednesday is the last day of the week, yes, because uh, Thursday is supposed to be Holy Communion. And they, so, so just for the record, those were days that were planned off um, in advance. Um, yeah. It was supposed to be uh, Thursday of next week was supposed to be Easter Communion. Um, so no class stuff. I mean... You know, it's one of those days where we probably would have met up first and second period, and we would have just done like homeroom stuff, checked our grade books, asked college questions, had me yell at you about student loans. Uh, and then Friday was planned off. Um, and the reason for that holiday on the calendar, it says AGBU Founders Day. Right. So yeah, Wednesday of next week will be the last day before spring break. And then you'll have off until uh, April, 13th. Oh, and April 13th is still part of spring break, so we actually don't go back to school until April 14th, which is a Tuesday. Mr. Robinson. Yeah? Um, 
how's next week looking for this class? What are we going to do? We have one more section. We're going to cover 9.4 on Monday. Uh, Tuesday will be time to workshop and review, and then we'll have a mid-chapter quiz Wednesday. Or if y'all don't feel cool about it being on Wednesday, I could probably give it Thursday. And then the only thing you would do Thursday is do that quiz for me and then go off to spring break. But I'll let y'all mm -hmm. decide based on how you feel about the notes on Monday. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, we'll, we'll end the last day with a quiz before we head out just so that we can like wrap everything up in a bow and then all graded over spring break. And then just to kind of get everybody back into it, we'll start off when we come back the Tuesday after with a review of that quiz. Mr. Robinson, you yep. go back to school on the 27th. No, like, like literal school. Though. Like the Zoom. No, yeah, no. So Zoom, oh, yeah. Zoom re resumes after spring break. We'll be back doing classes online on the 14th. Mr. Robson, mm -hmm. how are we going to take the test? Like, uh, is it going to be on Google Classroom or on Zoom? It's going to be on <laughs> Google. I mean, I expect everybody to log on on Zoom just so that you can ask questions uh, as we go along the test as people are prone to do. Uh, but I'm just going to make a PDF, upload it, you do the work, you turn it back in. All right. Thank you. Yeah, and I mean, it's going to be formatted like all my other tests, so if you like the way the pages are laid out or whatever, you can print it and do your work on there and then upload a scan of it to turn it in. Uh, or you can just, if you don't have a printer or don't want to waste paper, uh, you can work it out on just like white paper or whatever and then upload the work when you're done. Mm -hmm. And um, are you going to post like the do now thing so you can... And then I'm doing oh, that. word, word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I almost forgot. Yeah, let me post um, classwork week two. Oh, Ms. Rob, if we finish the homework, we're good? Uh, yeah, just be sure to also turn in the classwork. Yeah, for sure. All right. Okay, thank you. Yeah, have a nice weekend. Yeah, you, okay. you too. Pre-cal, geometry, AP physics, calculus, all students, 10 points due today. Uh, yeah, Ms. Robinson, um, that classwork. Yes. Uh, by the way, I was, uh, sorry I was late today. My internet, I had a problem with my internet again. Oh, no problem. I'll fix the attendance up real like, quick. It's all, always like at 8 in the morning, it just goes off lately. Yeah, bro, because like every kid in the country who has online classes is getting like logging on to Zoom all at the same yeah. time. Yeah, it's cool. I mean, yesterday I couldn't even post the freaking Zoom link because of how bogged down uh, Google yeah. Classroom was. Um, okay, I made you not absent. Thank you. Mr. Robinson? Yep. I was also late yesterday. I logged on when you were talking about, like, before you started the graphs, the last section of the notes. I also had a problem with the internet, but I also woke up a little late. Okay, you are also no longer absent yesterday. Okay, thank you. Mr. Robinson, was I tardy today too? Uh, no, you were logged on when I took attendance. Okay, thank you. So I bought some video games on um, uh, Facebook Marketplace, right? Uh, and here's what I'm doing to do the pickup or whatever. I sent the dude money through PayPal on Facebook Marketplace. And the dude is just going to like meet me at a high school inland. And he's just going to like toss the games on the lawn and then I'm going to pick them up. Just throw it on the lawn and pick it up. Yeah, dog, this apocalypse stuff is wild of like, hey, how does one hand someone else uh, a video game without coming within six feet of them? Yeah, I already sent the homie the money. So hopefully this dude isn't just like, oh boy, a free 60 bucks. Uh, and yeah, he's just going to toss him out and then I'm going to pick him up and I'm going to wear gloves and sanitize him before I take him home. <laughs> Uh, 
totally worth it though. It's uh, uh, the Kirby Dream Collection for Wii. It's like still new in the packaging, unopened. It's got all the discs and stuff. It's all the good Kirby games on one disc. All, all of nice. them. All right, Mr. Robinson, if I submitted the homework, can I leave? Yep. All right, thank you. We'll see you. Uh, have a nice weekend. Yeah, there's no point in keeping sure. it. I mean, this is the way it should always be when you're done with the work. You should just be able to roll, right? Yeah, all right. I'll see you. Yep. Yeah, see you, Mr. Robinson. Yeah, y'all have a nice weekend. After you get the homework uploaded, feel free to head out. Like I said, be sure to get the classwork up. Oh, yeah, also, I know I'm, like, not wearing a dress shirt. It's because it's casual Friday. Shut up. Mr. Robinson? Yep. How is, like, the information that we found out yesterday about, like, the United States being the number one country with coronavirus cases, um, do you think that there's, like, any likelihood that we'll be going back? Uh to physical school before the school year ends? Yeah. Um, the... Probably for like a week or two, not more. No. I, yeah, I won't contradict, huh? If it's for a week or two, we'll go back? Uh, I won't contradict the official um, stance of the office but as of right now i believe the official stance is that there is some time that we are planning on returning in april though um we are all living through this emergency day by day right so at any point we could reassess and delay returning to physical campus uh later and later and later and later though here's the information i'm going to furnish you with that is what i'm using to make my judgment calls right now um, Cal State LA and basically all of the universities down here have already admitted that we're shut down for the semester. Jesus. Like for Cal State LA, um, they already sent out the email that said, hey, we're not reopening physical campus until the end of, of uh, basically until next fall. Um, and so all of my classes, the lab classes that involve being physically in a laboratory doing an experiment, all of them have had to redo their instruction last minute. So instead of finishing the lab, I have to like now read a book and do like 30 pages of problems um, in order to pass that class, you know, but colleges, they all know that if you sh keep it shut down until the summer and then don't have summer school also, you know, it purchases the summer being connected to this quarantine. So instead of us being separated from each other physically for like two and a half months, by butting it up against the summer, it purchases you five and a half months of, of no human human contact. But like I said, the official stance of the school right now is that we will reassess and we should reconvene late in April, but the colleges have already planned to be shut down until summer. I heard that um, the peak of like coronavirus cases for the United States is going to be from mid-April to late April. Uh, that is math. Yeah, math allows us to do radical things like predicting the future, not just of what happens when two balls collide at a specific speed. But yeah, you can totally predict based on changes from day to day uh, where the infection is headed. And yeah, we're definitely still on the way up. We're not even close to our country's peak yet. Our, our healthcare system, man, it's like they keep cutting and cutting like expenses, and then when we actually need it, it's not there. It's just so stupid. Huh? I don't know what to say. Um, I mean, yeah, so the thing that you're describing is a common complaint held by people that, uh, y yes, if you have um, a healthcare system of the design that ours is that you are incapable of responding to emergencies of this nature. Yeah, what's the question? Number 41 to 45, this says label all points of intersection, as in say the coordinates? Yeah. So how do we do that? So I have the graph in front of me, but how do I get the coordinates? Do I just have to um, like the, the same thing, same thing as the rest of the questions? 
Yeah, so you substitute them across each other. So um, yeah, I see. All right. Uh, yeah, how does so it work if it's less than or equal to? It doesn't matter to solve for the intersections. Just treat them like they're all equal. Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, but yeah, no, totally. Like the healthcare infrastructure in this country is a bunch of private corporations who operate the way they do in order to maximize that profit. Which means, you know, conserving certain supplies, not over expanding. And so the healthcare system is optimized to do what it does on a daily basis, like the number of ICUs that we have is set up, designed based on the needs of a city. So like at any given time, an ICU is half to 75% full of people who are old and dying of some disease or people who were recently in a traumatic injury or whatever. But when you have this many people who need ICU care all at once, uh, it overwhelms so it's the not capacity. Capable. Correct, yeah. yeah. And we're not expanding quick enough to deal with where we're going to be at in a month or two. So the best thing that you can do to help is uh, stay at home and don't get sick so that you aren't part of like the healthcare system becoming overburdened. Mr. Robinson. Yep. Can you go over completing the square again? Gladly. Please give a quadratic. It doesn't matter what quadratic, just give me anything of the form y is equal to ax squared plus bx plus c. Is so can I give it from the homework? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. 4x squared minus 25x plus 6. Oh, well, I like it. That one's ugly. Yeah. Um, so the first thing that I'm going to do to complete this, oh, you said it's equal to 0. This isn't equal to y. Yeah, it's equal to 0. Okay, uh, it doesn't matter, the technique's exactly the same. Zero is equal to four X squared minus 25 X plus six. So what I'm gonna do here is the first thing is I'm going to uh, move that constant over. So this is gonna be negative six is equal to four X squared minus 25 X. And then in order to complete the square, I got to acknowledge that to do that, my lead coefficient on X squared has to be one. I'm gonna divide both sides of this equation by four. So that gives me negative, 3 over 2, just because it's 6 over 4, then simplified. And this is going to be equal to x squared minus 25 over 4x. And now to complete the square, I need to invent my magic number. And my magic number is always going to be this middle digit, which I'm going to call b. Uh, somebody's microphone is open and causing me a feedback. Uh, this is b, and the number that I have to add to each side, which is magic, is b over 2 quantity squared. So I'm going to take this guy, 25 over 4, and I'm going to cut him in half and square him. So that's going to give me uh, 25 over 8, and then that number squared is what I'm going to add to each side. So this is going to be plus 25 over 8 quantity squared. And then here on the left, I have to add that same number just because that's algebra, just to make sure that the two sides are equal. Uh, is this okay? Are there any questions up to here? Yeah, that's good. Okay. Uh, and now the reason why I like that is that on the right-hand side, that's going to allow me to write a perfect square factorial. The right-hand side becomes x minus 25 over 8 quantity squared. And then on the left-hand side, this is going to be some digit. It's going to be some sucky fraction. Uh, but we live in the future, so instead of actually dealing with the fraction, it's going to be 25 divided by 8 quantity squared minus 3 divided by 2. And I want that as a fraction, so I hit it with the math frac. Okay, so that's 529 over 64. 529 over 64. And then I subtract that guy back over, and I get that 0 is equal to x minus 25 over 8 quantity squared minus 529 divided by 64. Or if you didn't want to say that this was 0 equals, this is also what y would be equal to in case you were trying to graph this guy. Is that okay? Yeah, thank you. You're welcome.
oh man the other thing that i'm like really thankful for these days um i know i've been yelling at y'all to like exercise or whatever uh do any of y'all have a switch out there yes have it's like sold out yeah. be because everybody like did a big rush on exercise equipment once we all realized we were going to be stuck at home like my wife ordered uh one of those big bouncy balls that you sit on for exercise you know what i'm saying um also like elastic bands or whatever have y'all any of you have a copy of ring fit oh no oh yeah, I've heard of it. it's tight like i you know i'm a fairly fit person like i run marathons or whatever i thought it was going to be all like weak and sad the way that like um we fit was with that balance board um Yo, ring fit is brutal. Like the workouts actually make me work up a sweat and get me tired. Uh, that game is supposed to be seventy-five bucks for the ring and the the game that comes with it. Uh, but right now it's eBaying for like two hundred fifty dollars, just because it like sold out everywhere as soon as everybody realized we were going to be stuck at home for months. Um, I believe Nintendo is putting it back into production. So if you see a new production line released and you are looking for a good way to exercise at home. I would pick it up once it comes back down to normal price, uh, especially because yesterday Nintendo did a Nintendo Direct and they released new content for it for free. It now has like a rhythm game built into it. Um, Yo. But yeah, it is a surprisingly legit workout. Surprisingly legit. I would uh, look it up in case you were looking for a way that you could work out and just like set an alert for it on Amazon or on eBay for when the price comes back down. Don't pay two fifty for it. It's good, but it's not that good. Uh, Mr. Robinson, if we have time, um, can we quickly go over number uh, 21 for the, from the homework? Um, uh, yeah, so that's a sir. I'm sorry, that's two ellipses? Yeah, two ellipses, yeah. Yeah. Um, so... Choose substitution or elimination. I mean, I, I went with substitution. Yeah, I would I, definitely say substitution, and I would substitute across Y squared. Right. Yeah. Like the the equation is really complicated, but the answer is just five comma zero. So I I I, I wasn't able to get that. Yeah. Uh, give me one second. I'm graphing it in Desmos. And then I'll show y'all how to do the uh, algebras for this one. Um, yep, okay. Share, share, okay. So uh, here's our graph. That first equation, 9x squared plus 25y squared is equal to 225 gives us our big red ellipse. And then the equation down here, x minus six quantity squared plus y squared is equal to one is a circle with a radius of one shifted over six units to the right. And so they only have one point of intersection. Is that okay? Right. Okay. So I'm going to pop back. Um, what we need to do is substitute across that y squared. And so uh, if I take that second equation, the circle, and I solve it for y squared, I'm going to get that that equation is actually y squared is equal to 1 minus the quantity of x minus 6 quantity squared. And then I would need to take this and pop it into my equation for the ellipse. So it's 9x squared plus 25 quantity y squared. This is y squared. 1 minus x minus 6 quantity squared is equal to 225. Uh, you'll have to take and, I'm sorry, that square is in the wrong position. Don't write that. No, it's, it's. I think there's two actually. No, because this is right. y squared and I'm substituting oh, yeah, out y squared. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, okay. so all you need to do is take this expand and then take the 25 and then distribute. Dis distribute, okay. And then that will produce a new quadratic which only has one solution. Yep, okay, thank you. Yeah, I think the problem is you had a double square, huh? Yeah. Cool, yeah, be careful with that. If you're substituting y squared for y squared, there's no double square. Uh, anyway, I'm gonna head out. Uh, Y'all have a nice weekend and if you, um, have any questions, shoot me an email. Uh, I'll see y'all for lecture on Monday morning where we'll be going over the last uh, section of this chapter before our quiz. We'll take that quiz next week before we head out, Wednesday or Thursday, depending on what y'all want. And then when we come back from break, we'll hit the second half of this chapter, which is totally different from the first half.